We've been going through the miracles of Mark, so we're going to continue along that line. If you would turn with me to Mark in chapter 5. The Gospel of Mark in chapter 5. I shared with you last week, for those of you that were here, that sandwiched in between the miracle of, of Jairus, uh, ruler of the synagogue, coming to Jesus and, and Jesus uh, raising his young daughter from her deathbed, there was a story tucked in in between. And it was a miracle because this woman had an issue of blood and we automatically think of women's processes and everything they go through, but we don't know. Many commentators point out the fact that this could have been uh, something that was oozing, something that it, we know from the Gospels that she'd had this issue for about 12 years. So no doubt she was probably infectious, uh, no doubt that she was shunned all, from all society. But there are some things in regards to this miracle. And it's kind of ironic that we see as we look at this miracle that took place in the Gospel of Mark. That she was healed from an issue of blood. But we are healed because of blood. You see the Bible tells us that when Jesus shed his blood upon Calvary. That we have the opportunity to have our sins washed away. The prophet Isaiah says that though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. He says that by his stripes, we are healed. He was speaking obviously a prophetic message in concerning the coming of Jesus. And so we see that we're healed from, by blood where this woman was healed from an issue that derived from blood. Several things, we're going to begin reading in verse 25, and we're going to read down through verse 34. But there are several things I want to point out to you in regards to this woman and her faith. But let's begin reading in verse 25, Mark in chapter 5. It says, I'm reading from the King James Version this morning. It says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? In verse 31, And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, pay special attention, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Let's bow our heads once again in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you have the healing touch. Lord, when people seek you out, they find that you're already seeking them. And Lord, that you can heal all manner of diseases, but Lord, you choose to heal the disease of sin. As people come and, and acknowledge you as Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, we recognize your power and authority over sin and death and the grave. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Though we don't deserve life, Lord, you call us from death into the glorious light of everlasting life. Lord, we thank you for the response of many who've had their names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, that one of these days will enter into celestial glory and there be forever with you and all of the saints. Lord, if there be one here who does not know you as Lord and Savior of their life, speak to their hearts and draw them to you. Lord, that they might sense your touch and the healing taking place in their soul. Lord, forgive us where we fail you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now there are some things that I want you to notice concerning this woman. 
First of all, she'd had this issue not for six months, not for, not for a year, not for, not for two years or three years, but for 12 long years. This woman had exhausted, uh, possibly exhausted not only her, her life, but she had exhausted all of her well-being. She had exhausted everything that she had. She had gone to various doctors, and most will tell you, if you go and you look back at Jewish history, uh, most will tell you that the Jewish doctors in those days, they tried all kinds of things, and they had all kinds of processes that they would go through in an attempt to heal the sick. And here it is, yet this woman has gone and, and spent all of her livelihood going to these doctors and she's had various procedures done and yet none of these doctors, not a one of these doctors could heal the problem that she had. For 12 long years she had been battling this problem, this ailment, this disease. And I like the way that Mark puts it, this plague. You know, when I think of a plague, I think of a, a sickness or a disease that is overwhelming almost, almost unreconcilable. A disease so vast, when, you know, I automatically think in, uh, back in the times of, of history of things like the bubonic plague, plague or the Spanish flu. We know that the result of those disastrous diseases killed thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people and yet doctors had no cure my friend the greatest disease that mankind suffers from day today there's no cure from humanity no doctor no specialist that can cure it except let me tell you one except jesus so I want us to look at several things in regards to this woman and the healing of her disease and the way that she came to the conclusion. First of all, we know that this woman made a movement of faith. If you notice what it says in verse, uh, verse 26, it says, And suffered, suffered many things under many physicians and spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. But when she heard, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. First she said, verse 28, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be healed. Or I shall be whole. This woman, for this woman, she knew that the solution to her greatest problem at the time was just to be in the presence of Jesus. You see, this woman's issue, as we've spoken of, this woman's issue was not only physically debilitating, but it also made her ceremonially, ceremonially unclean in that she could not enter into the temple. She would have been shunned by all not able to even go into the temple and to worship for the priest would have told her. They would have kicked her out. They never would have let her in if she'd have managed to make it to the front door. What a terrible, terrible situation that this woman had found herself in for a period of 12 years. But she had a movement of faith that she knew if she could just touch the hem or the clothes of Jesus. That her condition would make, be made all the better. She'd exhausted all other avenues. She had gone to every doctor. She had spent all that she had. And now she finds that Jesus is a last resort. But she's come to the conclusion. After she's heard all of the miracles that Jesus has performed. She's come to the conclusion that Jesus is the only way. And by the way, the Bible tells us that, does it not? Jesus said in John in chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. You see, this woman's physical condition, it's a symbol of our spiritual condition. We're 
physically, spiritually debilitated. We're dead in sin. A condition that no doctor, no specialist, no one of mankind can cure. And yet we find that when we come to Jesus, when we meet Jesus, we find the opportunity to have this condition that makes us ceremonially unclean. And the fact that we are unclean, unprepared to enter into the presence of heaven. I want you to notice this also. As we look to the woman, we cannot miss the crown. One verse that uses the word press. When the disciples respond to Jesus, when he asked the question, who touched me? The disciples use the word, or uh, the word that's used in the King James English is throng. But if you go back and you look at the original Greek text, you learn that that word in the Greek means surrounded, pressing in to the point that Jesus is literally being crushed in the crowd. There's no way the disciples say, there's no way that you have sent someone touching you. After all, you can't put a, a finger on one individual. Look, Jesus, have you seen all of these people? Mark uses the words much people. Much people. I think that we can safely come to the conclusion. If you look back in the scriptures, you understand that Jesus has just finished feeding 5,000. When people had heard that Jesus had gone, come back to town, no doubt they were either wanting their belly filled or they were wanting to see another magic trick as some of them proposed. Some of them perhaps had dear departed loved ones that they wanted to see raised from the dead or some of them perhaps had a disease or an affliction in themselves or, or in one of their, their family members that they wanted to get Jesus to come to their house. That was the instance with Jairus. The disciples point out to Jesus, listen, Jesus, look at this crowd that you've drawn. People are bumping into you. And you ask the question, who touched me? Literally, you're being crushed by the crowd. But Jesus, the Savior, even in the midst of this crushing, pressing, thronging crowd. To me, it brings about the idea that there, Jesus didn't have enough room to breathe, much less turn around, but he did. At the very moment that he sensed this power exuding from his body as this woman touched his garment, he questioned. Who touched me? Who touched me? How many of y'all been keeping up with the College World Series? Boy, I'm glad to know we got a lot of baseball fans. <laughs> I love baseball. Y'all know that. I shared that with you before. Very seldom have I gotten to participate in a dog pile. At the end of a victorious series or, or, or being victorious in a game, oftentimes there's one player on the team that, it, that has proved to be outstanding or perhaps he's hit the, home, hit the home run at the very last inning and won the game or the sacrifice fly has happened in one of the games just the other day and, and has driven in the winning run at the very bottom of the ninth. And oftentimes when a team is victorious, especially you'll see at the end of the World Series, for those of you that don't watch the World Series, you'll probably see pictures in the newspaper. And if you don't get the newspaper, you'll see it on the internet. If you don't get the internet, you're just out of the loop. (laughs) 
But what happens at the end of the game? Whether it's a pitcher or a batter or a defensive player who has caught the winning out or hit the hit in the winning run or struck out the last batter at the bottom of the ninth and prevented the other team from scoring. You'll see the team rush out of the dugout. And oftentimes, we used to call it tackling. They'll tackle that player in the middle of the field if they can catch him. It's a time of celebration, but it's a time also in which the person on the bottom of the pile is getting crushed, and he doesn't know which one's crushing him. Because everyone on the team is pressing him. In those instances, it's celebratory. In the instance of Jesus, people were just wanting to see one more thing. They were just wanting Jesus to provide one more thing. Jesus, however, points to this one individual. He says, touch me. The woman very humbly, when she discovers that she's been out of Perhaps she thought that, you know, in this crowd, nobody will ever notice. Perhaps she thought, well, you know what, if I, if I can just touch Jesus' clothes, I'll be all the better and he'll be none the wiser. When Jesus said, who touched me? The woman came very humbly and fell at Jesus' feet. Secondly, I want you to look at this. It was a motion of faith. Some of you may say, well, preacher, isn't a movement of faith and a motion of faith uh, basically the same thing? I want, to look at, want you to look, consider it this way. As far as the movement of faith, this woman had to move through the crowd undetected or in an attempt to be undetected. But in a motion of faith, in a motion of faith, it is something that is direct. And we see that in this instance, it required a touch. It wasn't just enough to be in the vicinity of Jesus. She moved to be closer to Jesus, but she took direct action just to touch Jesus. And a part of that touch required that she reach towards Jesus to, for her to reach through the crowd. Mark says that she in her own mind conceived the idea of she could just touch the clothes of Jesus. But if you look, if you consider the statement, she wasn't saying, listen, she didn't need a physical, personal touch of Jesus. She just needed to touch his clothes. But if you look at the Gospel of Luke, in Luke in chapter 8 and verse 44, it says, came behind him and touched the border of his garments. Touched the border of his garments. Matthew says much the same thing. And I'm going to put that verse up here for you in just a moment. But ultimately, she didn't touch his whole garment. She didn't go up there and wrap his hand, wrap her arms around Jesus. She didn't go up there and just grab a halt. Rather, she touched his hem, the very border. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 20 says this. And in regards to this same story. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. If you go and you look at the Greek word that's translated here, hem, or clothing in Mark, same Greek word. Literally, it's as if she just reached out and touched, you know, the stitching. Or as some would describe it, the tassels that hung down on uh, decorated Jewish clothing. Just the tassel. Remember, she didn't reach out and grasp Jesus' clothes. She didn't 
grab hold and hold on with all our might and say, Jesus, here, here, here. It's just a simple touch. Just a simple touch. You see, that was the motion of her faith. The movement of her faith was through the crowd towards Jesus. The motion of her faith was reaching out to touch him. Or to touch the tassels or the hem of his clothing. The result of that was this. Look with me in verse 29. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Remember all of the doctors that she'd seen? Remember all of the money that she'd spent? To which there was no avail and yet just to reach out and touch the hem or the tassel of Jesus' clothing was enough that she felt her body being restored. Look down at verse 32. And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. If you go back to verse 30, Mark says that Jesus sensed the virtue, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. You see, what happened when this woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment was a miracle of faith. If you, if you remember what she said, if I can just but touch his clothing, I'll be made whole. Which points us to the Savior's power. No doubt that if this woman had had this issue for 12 years, some commentators point out that perhaps it was a bloody flux, nasty infection. Her life would not be much longer on this earth. In other words, she was dying. She was dying. Jesus sensed the power going from him. The woman sensed the power coming into her. And it was a miracle. It was a miracle. Something that no doctor could do, nor money could buy. Jesus did. Is all the result of this woman's faith. Look with me. In verse 34, Jesus looks at this woman and he says, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. You see, it was a, it was a matter of the woman's faith. She knew if she could, could just get through the crowd just close enough to touch out to reach out and to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, she knew that he had the power and authority to heal him if she could just get to it. The crowd is pressing. The woman is maneuvering. And then she's reaching she knew that what man couldn't do what was impossible with men is possible with God I think there's a Bible verse to that extent and she receives the Savior's assurance look with me he says thy faith is made the old Last part of verse 34. 
Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. The Jewish word for peace is shalom. It's a very calming word. It's a greeting in Jewish terms and also a salutation. It means literally peace and goodwill. God's peace and goodwill. What an assuring, what an assuring peace it is to know that Jesus has healed you. It's what the Bible calls joy everlasting. There's an old hymn that we, that we sing on occasion. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's as Jesus told the woman at the well. For whoever shall drink of the water that I give them shall be within them wells of water springing up. Which points us also to the woman's path from that day forward. Last part. Go in peace and be whole that I pray. Jesus didn't say, as doctors will tell you these days, I want you to see my receptionist and I want you to reschedule an appointment for next month. Or I need you to at least come back once a year. You see, at that very point, Jewish, Jewish people had to go to the temple once a year to present, to present a sacrifice to cover their sins. Blood had to be shed once a year. But in the case of this woman, this, Jesus said, go in peace and be whole. He didn't say you can come back tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. This issue that this woman perhaps had been fighting for most of her earthly life. Jesus might as well have said, Shalom, from now on. Go in peace and be made whole. You see, there's a certain amount of peace that comes from the touch of Jesus. This miracle was different from many other miracles that Jesus had performed. Many of the other miracles, it, it, it required a direct, direct contact by Jesus' hands are Jesus' words, much like Jairus' daughter, when he tells her, Daughter, arise. But we need to never miss this that Jesus the central figure. The woman's faith caused her to put Jesus as her primary goal. It wasn't, if you know, if I can just get to that second row of people, or if I can just touch someone who's touching Jesus, Or if I just know someone else who's been healed by Jesus, then I too shall be healed now. It was a direct movement of faith, a motion of faith, and a miracle of faith. It caused this woman to be healed, and from that day forward, Jesus says, go. Much like the woman caught in adultery, to which Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. 
This woman, he says, go in peace. You made whole. My friends, let me tell you something. Jesus can do a spectacular work in the life of one who comes to him through faith. He can cause the vilest of diseases to be healed. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. It points out the fact that the end result is death. And in a spiritual sense, it means an eternal separation from the living. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh but not for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it life abundantly. There's that well springing up. Abundant life. Elsewhere, Jesus uses the phrase everlasting life. Some translations put it eternal life. In the same way that he told this woman to go in peace and be made whole. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me, let me clarify something for you. Okay? You are dead in sin. You are separated from the living Children of God. God may be calling you today to enter into His presence and to be saved. And have your name written down in heaven. To transfer your citizenship from this old world to the glorious presence of God. How will you respond to God's grace and God's mercy and God's invitation? Let's stand together this morning as our music team comes. If God's laid upon your heart a decision that you need to make public this morning. How will you respond? Let me make a suggestion to you. Respond honestly. Respond humbly. And respond publicly. And the way that you respond in those three ways is you honestly take an inward look at your spiritual condition and your daily walk. You humbly come before the Lord confessing your sins and asking, asking Him to save you. And you publicly profess Him as Jesus, as Lord and Savior of your life. Jesus said, Whosoever will not confess me before man, I will not confess him before my Father. And the way that you do that is during this time of invitation, dedication, just step out of the aisle and come and have a seat on the front row. I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise you. But let me explain to you more about what it means to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and what it means after you do. We have no preacher in the congregation and I know that he'd be more than happy to share with you what a relationship with Christ can do for you. Will you come? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we thank you for the witness that we've been able to see this morning through baptism. And Lord, the witness of your spirit through your, in your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for that soul cleansing power. <coughs> which comes from the blood of the Lamb. Lord, I ask you to lead us and guide us during this time. Lord, we pray simply your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.